The Man Who Was Thursday, Chapter 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Was Thursday, A Nightmare, by G. K. Chesterton. Read by Zachary Brewster Geis, April 2007, Waterbury, Connecticut. Chapter 6 the exposure. Such were the six men who had sworn to destroy the world. Again and again Syme strove to pull together his common sense in their presence. Sometimes he saw for an instant that these notions were subjective, that he was only looking at ordinary men, one of whom was old, another nervous, another short-sighted. The sense of an unnatural symbolism always settled back on him again. Each figure seemed to be somehow on the borderland of things, just as their theory was on the borderland of thought. He knew that each one of these men stood at the extreme end, so to speak, of some wild road of reasoning. He could only fancy, as in some old-world fable, that if a man went westward to the end of the world he would find something, say a tree, that was more or less than a tree, a tree possessed by a spirit and that if he went east to the end of the world he would find something else that was not wholly itself a tower perhaps of which the very shape was wicked so these figures seemed to stand up violent and unaccountable against an ultimate horizon visions from the verge the ends of the earth were closing in talk had been going on steadily as he took in the scene and not the least of the contrasts of that bewildering breakfast-table was the contrast between the easy and unobtrusive tone of talk and its terrible purport. They were deep in the discussion of an actual and immediate plot. The waiter downstairs had spoken quite correctly when he said that they were talking about bombs and kings. Only three days afterwards the Tsar was to meet the President of the French Republic in Paris, and over their bacon and eggs upon their sunny balcony these beaming gentlemen had decided how both should die. Even the instrument was chosen. The black-bearded Marquis, it appeared, was to carry the bomb. Ordinarily speaking, the proximity of this positive and objective crime would have sobered Syme, and cured him of all his merely mystical tremors. He would have thought of nothing but the need of saving at least two human bodies from being ripped in pieces with iron and roaring gas. But the truth was that by this time he had begun to feel a third kind of fear, more piercing and practical than either his moral revulsion or his social responsibility. Very simply, he had no fear to spare for the French president or the Tsar. He had begun to fear for himself. Most of the talkers took little heed of him, debating now with their faces closer together and almost uniformly grave save when for an instant the smile of the secretary ran aslant across his face as the jagged lightning runs aslant across the sky. But there was one persistent thing which first troubled Syme and at last terrified him. The president was always looking at him, steadily and with a great and baffling interest. The enormous man was quite quiet, but his blue eyes stood out of his head, and they were always fixed on Syme. Syme felt moved to spring up and leap over the balcony. When the President's eyes were on him, he felt as if he were made of glass. He had hardly the shred of a doubt that in some silent and extraordinary way Sunday had found out that he was a spy. He looked over the edge of the balcony and saw a policeman standing abstractedly just beneath, staring at the bright railings and the sunlit trees. Then there fell upon him the great temptation that was to torment him for many days. In the presence of these powerful and repulsive men, who were the princes of anarchy, he had almost forgotten the frail and fanciful figure of the poet Gregory, the mere aesthete of anarchism. He even thought of him now with an old kindness, as if they had played together when children. But he remembered that he was still tied to Gregory by a great promise. He had promised never to do the very thing that he now felt himself almost in the act of doing. He had promised not to jump over that balcony and speak to that policeman. He took his cold hand off the cold stone balustrade. His soul swayed in a vertigo of moral indecision. 
He had only to snap the thread of a rash vow made to a villainous society, and all his life could be as open and sunny as the square beneath him. He had, on the other hand, only to keep his antiquated honor and be delivered inch by inch into the power of this great enemy of mankind, whose very intellect was a torture-chamber. Whenever he looked down into the square, he saw the comfortable policeman, a pillar of common sense and common order. Whenever he looked back at the breakfast-table, he saw the President still quietly studying him with big, unbearable eyes. In all the torrent of his thought there were two thoughts that never crossed his mind. First, it never occurred to him to doubt that the President and his counsel could crush him if he continued to stand alone. The place might be public, the project might seem impossible. But Sunday was not the man who would carry himself thus easily, without having, somehow or somewhere, set open his iron trap. Either by anonymous poison, or sudden street accident, by hypnotism, or by fire from hell, Sunday could certainly strike him. If he defied the man he was probably dead, either struck stiff there in his chair, or long afterwards as by an innocent ailment. If he called in the police promptly, arrested every one, told all, and set against them the whole energy of England, he would probably escape. Certainly not otherwise. They were a balcony full of gentlemen overlooking a bright and busy square, but he felt no more safe with them than if they had been a boat full of armed pirates overlooking an empty sea. There was a second thought that never came to him. It never occurred to him to be spiritually won over to the enemy. Many moderns, inured to a weak worship of intellect and force, might have wavered in their allegiance under this oppression of a great personality. They might have called Sunday the Superman. If any such creature be conceivable, he looked, indeed, somewhat like it, with his earth-shaking abstraction as of a stone statue walking. He might have been called something above man, with his large plans, which were too obvious to be detected with his large face, which was too frank to be understood. But this was a kind of modern meanness to which Syme could not sink, even in his extreme morbidity. Like any man, he was coward enough to fear great force, but he was not quite coward enough to admire it. The men were eating as they talked, and even in this they were typical. Dr. Bull and the Marquis ate casually and conventionally of the best things on the table, cold pheasant or Strasbourg pie. But the secretary was a vegetarian, and he spoke earnestly of the projected murder over half a raw tomato and three quarters of glass of tepid water. The old professor had such slops as suggested a sickening second childhood. And even in this President Sunday preserved his curious predominance of mere mass, for he ate like twenty men. He ate incredibly, with a frightful freshness of appetite, so that it was like watching a sausage factory. Yet continually, when he had swallowed a dozen crumpets, or drunk a quart of coffee, he would be found with his great head on one side, staring at Syme. "'I have often wondered,' said the Marquis, taking a great bite out of a slice of bread and jam, "'whether it wouldn't be better for me to do it with a knife. Most of the best things have been brought off with a knife, and it would be a new emotion to get a knife into a French president and wriggle it round.' "'You are wrong,' said the secretary drawing his black brows together. The knife was merely the expression of the old personal quarrel with a personal tyrant. Dynamite is not only our best tool, but our best symbol. It is as perfect a symbol of us as incense is of the prayers of the Christians. It expands. It only destroys because it broadens. Even so, thought only destroys because it broadens. A man's brain is a bomb, he cried out, loosening suddenly his strange passion and striking his own skull with violence. My brain feels like a bomb night and day. It must expand. It must expand. A man's brain must expand if it breaks up the universe. I don't want the universe broken up just yet, drawled the Marquis. I want to do a lot of beastly things before I die. I thought of one yesterday in bed. No, if the only end of the thing is nothing, said Dr. Bull, with his sphinx-like smile, it hardly seems worth doing. The old professor was staring at the ceiling with dull eyes. Every man knows in his heart, he said, that nothing is worth doing. There was a singular silence. 
And then the secretary said, We are wandering, however, from the point. The only question is how Wednesday is to strike the blow. I take it we should all agree with the original notion of a bomb. As to the actual arrangements, I should suggest that tomorrow morning he should go first of all to— The speech was broken off short under a vast shadow. President Sunday had risen to his feet, seeming to fill the sky above them. "'Before we discuss that,' he said in a small, quiet voice, "'let us go into a private room. I have something very particular to say.' Syme stood up before any of the others. The instant of choice had come at last. The pistol was at his head. On the pavement before he could hear the policeman idly stir and stamp, for the morning, though bright, was cold. A barrel organ in the street suddenly sprang with a jerk into a jovial tune. Syme stood up taut, as if it had been a bugle before the battle. He found himself filled with a supernatural courage that came from nowhere. That jingling music seemed full of the vivacity, the vulgarity, and the irrational valor of the poor, who in all those unclean streets were all clinging to the decencies and the charities of Christendom. His youthful prank of being a policeman had faded from his mind. He did not think of himself as the representative of the corps of gentlemen turned into fancy constables, or of the old eccentric who lived in the dark room. But he did feel himself as the ambassador of all these common and kindly people in the street who every day marched into the battle to the music of the barrel organ and this high pride in being human had lifted him unaccountably to an infinite height above the monstrous men around him. For an instant, at least, he looked down upon all their sprawling eccentricities from the starry pinnacle of the commonplace. He felt towards them all that unconscious and elementary superiority that a brave man feels over powerful beasts or a wise man over powerful errors. He knew that he had neither the intellectual nor the physical strength of President Sunday, but in that moment he minded it no more than the fact that he had not the muscles of a tiger or a horn on his nose like a rhinoceros. All was swallowed up in an ultimate certainty that the President was wrong and that the barrel organ was right. There clanged in his mind that unanswerable and terrible truism in the Song of Roland. Pagan en peur et chrétien en droit, which in the old nasal French has the clang and groan of great iron. This liberation of his spirit from the load of his weakness went with a quite clear decision to embrace death. If the people of the barrel organ could keep their old world obligations, so could he. This very pride in keeping his word was that he was keeping it to miscreants. It was his last triumph over these lunatics to go down into their dark room and die for something that they could not even understand. The barrel organ seemed to give the marching tune with the energy and the mingled noises of a whole orchestra, and he could hear deep and rolling, under all the trumpets of the pride of life, the drums of the pride of death. The conspirators were already filling through the open window and into the rooms behind. Syme went last, outwardly calm, but with all his brain and body throbbing with romantic rhythm. The President led them down an irregular side stair, such as might be used by servants, and into a dim, cold, empty room, with a table and benches, like an abandoned boardroom. When they were all in, he closed and locked the door. The first to speak was Gogol the irreconcilable, who seemed bursting with inarticulate grievance. "'Zo! Zo!' he cried, with an obscure excitement, his heavy Polish accent becoming almost impenetrable. "'You say you not hide. You say you show themselves. It is on nothings. When you want talk important, you run yourselves in a dark box.' The President seemed to take the foreigner's incoherent satire with entire good humour. "'You can't get hold of it yet, Gogol. he said in a fatherly way. "'When once they have heard us talking nonsense on that balcony, they will not care where we go afterwards. If we had come here first, we should have had the whole staff at the keyhole. You don't seem to know anything about mankind.' "'I die for them!' cried the Pole in thick excitement. "'And I slay their oppressors. I care not for these games of concealment. I would smite the tyrant in the open square. I see, I see, said the President, 
nodding kindly, as he seated himself at the top of a long table. "'You die for mankind first, and then you get up and smite their oppressors, so that's all right. And now may I ask you to control your beautiful sentiments, and sit down with the other gentlemen at this table. For the first time this morning something intelligent is going to be said.' Syme, with the perturbed promptitude he had shown since the original summons, sat down first. Gogol sat down last, grumbling in his brown beard about gombromise. No one except Syme seemed to have any notion of the blow that was about to fall. As for him, he had merely the feeling of a man mounting the scaffold with the intention, at any rate, of making a good speech. "'Comrades,' said the President, suddenly rising, we have spun out this farce long enough. I have called you down here to tell you so simple and shocking that even the waiters upstairs, long inured to our levities, might hear some new seriousness in my voice. Comrades, we were discussing plans and naming places. I propose, before saying anything else, that those plans and places should not be voted by this meeting, but should be left wholly in the control of some one reliable member. I suggest Comrade Saturday, Dr. Bull. They all stared at him. Then they all started in their seats, for the next words, though not loud, had a living and sensational emphasis. Sunday struck the table. Not one word more about the plans and places must be said at this meeting. Not one tiny detail more about what we mean to do must be mentioned in this company. Sunday had spent his life in astonishing his followers, but it seemed as if he had never really astonished them until now. They all moved feverishly in their seats, except Syme. He sat stiff in his, with his hand in his pocket, and on the handle of his loaded revolver. When the attack on him came, he would sell his life dear. He would find out at least if the President was mortal. Sunday went on smoothly. You will probably understand that there is only one possible motive for forbidding free speech at this festival of freedom. Strangers overhearing us matters nothing. They assume that we are joking. But what would matter, even unto death, is this that there should be one actually among us who is not of us, who knows our grave purpose, but does not share it, who... The secretary screamed out suddenly like a woman. It can't be! he cried, leaping. There can't! The president flapped his large, flat hand on the table like the fin of some huge fish. Yes, he said slowly, there is a spy in this room. There is a traitor at this table. I will waste no more words. His name? Syme half rose from his seat, his finger firm on the trigger. His name is Gogol, said the President. He is that hairy humbug over there who pretends to be a Pole. Gogol sprang to his feet, a pistol in each hand. With the same flash, three men sprang at his throat. Even the professor made an effort to rise. But Syme saw little of the scene, for he was blinded with a beneficent darkness. He had sunk down into his seat, shuddering, in a palsy of passionate relief. End of chapter 6